Yeah, so I'm Eileen and I'm really excited to be able to present my research on the production of the new in 20th century Singapore. So this research was really much um, as a response to what I see as the lack of new artworks in our local Singapore art history. And so by production of the new, I'm mainly referring to the factors that influence the production of such artworks. So things like the institutional forces that actually in, um, affected the implement implementation of life drawing classes in our official school curriculums, for example, as well as the limited opportunity to take on new modelling as a profession itself, which limited this very incredible, uh, very valuable artistic resource for artists dealing with um, the figure as a form of art. Yeah. So I would just like to draw attention to this excerpt um, by Mr. Chia Wai Hon, uh, written and published in Art of the New Exhibition Catalogue. And this exhibition catalogue was um, published alongside Good 90s uh, fourth exhibition, no, third exhibition. Yeah, it was actually the first publication that they um, um, created. And so what is really fascinating about this um, piece of writing is that how the style of the writing and the tone of it really resembles an artistic manifesto. And it's very, um, we can kind of look at it as a form of artistic statement and good 90s artistic statement especially. And it's really interesting to see how Mr. Chia ended this entire essay on such an aspirational and sensational remark on the subject of the new, and which is also where I um, would was inspired to take it as the title of my research paper. And so this last line also really kindled my research and my interest into this research and how the biggest question that I had after reading it was, why did he say that? What made him say it? And what's wrong with the nude that made him have such a passionate remark and statement? And so before I really move on into what happened in our local artistic development, I also like to draw or turn our gaze towards what happened regionally. And so, can everyone spot the new model in this picture? I mean, it's quite obvious, right? She's the only one who is new against all the, everyone else who is clothed. And I don't know if you guys have also recognized a familiar face. So, um, this one is actually Liu Kang, who was also one of the prominent members of Group 90 and when he was really young. And he actually studied in uh, Shanghai Art College and was also a very good uh, friend with Mr. Liu Hai Su, the founder of Shanghai Art College. So this uh, entire nude model incident started when Mr. Liu, the founder, introduced a female nude model into one of his drawing classes at the college. And this entire gesture at, this, at what he's doing right, actually resulted in a huge public controversy that has also been known now as the nude model incident. Yeah, so, um, so Liu, Mr. Liu actually engaged in a series of really heated paint battles with his fellow artists as well as local Chinese um, warlords and magistrates were really much against what he was trying to do in his art school. And so this entire pen battle actually lasted for, as you can see from the time, up to like a certain decade. Yeah. And what is really interesting was how a lot of scholars see this battle as so-called a conflict between the progressive Western modern ideals versus what uh, you can say as the conservative Chinese social values. And so uh, actually, what the result of this entire debate right, was that there was actually a ban on the use of new models in drawing classes. And, but however, for Mr. Liu as well as his art college, it was, they actually enjoyed what I would call as an ideological victory because Liu was very much painted as this progressive art educator who is able to bring new and innovative methods into his art teaching. Whereas for Shanghai Art College, it's very much it's catapulted into fame as the progressive modern arts institution that kind of progresses with the times. Yeah. And so what is very interesting to me about how this incident um, is being framed is how the nude is being used as an instrument of modernity. So um, in a way that unlike what you might think the, the new in the Western um, art history will be like, the new here is really seen as this icon of um, a modern, uh, the icon of a modern art education as well as a modern art institution. And so as an instrument, it's been very much used as a tool of image making and branding for both Mr. Liu as the self-defined artist, as well as Shanghai Art College as the modern arts institution. So if we were to just bring our gaze back to the developments in our local sphere, one of our, so the one school that I can refer to is just Nanyang Academy of Arts, uh, founded in 1937, and also one of the longest running art schools in Singapore. So as you can tell from here, um, when it comes drawing from the nude figure, 
the students actually didn't really have much of a choice. And I also uh, quote Mr. Sabapati, who is also at the audience today, uh, how the students were actually really much copying and imitating plaster cast reproductions of human figures. And they could be either dressed, like fully dressed, the semi dressed, or like fully nude. So, in a way, you can also kind of say to what extent copy and imitation actually allows a student's artistic training to develop. Yeah, and so what is really, um, what is also interesting to take note from this period is that in the initial stages of NAFA's um, curriculum, a lot of its artistic pedagogy was very much inclined towards painting as the main goal. So, because a lot of its initial Chinese ed educators actually came from China, who then brought in with their Western trained backgrounds, so a lot of their curriculum was also focused on um, teaching the students Western oil painting alongside Chinese ink painting. So there was actually a very little emphasis on drawing as um, the form of um, the artist or the art students um, part of their education. And so you can also see that um, in a way drawing and not just and not drawing including life drawing was also like um, existing along the peripheries of artistic production due to the limitations of the pedagogical framework. Yeah, and so you also want to ask, so where are the new models then? Why do students just keep drawing from plaster cards? So if you want to look at new modeling as a profession, it actually really started off in the area of photography. So you have this article from the Straits Times 1956 that was actually the first public mention of new modeling um, in the local press. And it was really by a photographic society just saying that, oh, they are doing a new modeling for the sake of art. And so from the authority standpoint, new modeling was very much condoned as long as it was confined within an artistic practice. But then it was like, half a year later, in the same year, October, you have this peeping Tom incident that was actually threatening this profession of new modelling. Yeah, and also it was also one of the first incidents that actually also signaled the blurring of lines between art and voyeurism, whereby new modelling also came to be defined against a certain moral standard. Yeah. And so with all that in mind, we have artworks that are produced like this. So this is by Aang Ting. Um, and so, in a way that his comment here also kind of reflects the state of his art education when he was studying in NAFA. So if you can just break down his comment, right? So first, he said that we were desperate for life drawing in NAFA, but were not allowed. So this actually suggests a certain artistic demand by the students themselves to be able to learn life drawing and to be able to study from the new model. But they were not allowed because of the institutional forces as well as, which is, could be probably due to the moral, moral public sentiments at that time. And second, he said that the nearest we had was when a European lady volunteered to pose in a bikini. So the idea that the model was European also suggests a certain lack of supply of local nude models because no one was willing to take on this profession and pose in nude because of so much stigma against this um, so-called this job. Yeah, and lastly, uh, he said that uh, imagine we had to close all doors and windows. So that is kind of... Wow, you can really see uh, life drawing being seen as this abominable as well as repulsive thing that has to be hidden from the public eye, even though the students were just doing it as part of their regular artistic training. So, um, even though this is definitely not in one of his famous, famous works, but this is really important for us to contextualize this practice of life drawing and to look at new artworks within this context. Yeah, and also um, when it comes to new artworks in the local history, we can also we cannot forget about the Bali trip that the four artists embarked on in 1952. So uh, four artists are Liu Kang, Chong Ping, Chen Wenxi and Chen Chong Sui who went to Bali in 1952. So it was seen as this historic trip because the artworks that they produced actually very much um, um, gave them the so-called um, very much signaled the start of the Nayang style in a pictorial format and these four artists were actually immortalized as what you call the Nayang artists after the trip. Yeah. And what is interesting is also how a lot of their subject matter are also the half nude Balinese women and you can see them engaging in like everyday activities from just um, plucking fruits, the taking a nap or even like preparing offerings. So that is a very prominent subject matter in their works after this trip. And so in a way, if you want to look at the Nayan style, which is considered as a synthesis between Western aesthetics as well as the Southeast Asian imagery, you can see that the artists are painting in a Western style, but 
by using the half-nude Balinese women, they are able to kind of contextualize it within the Southeast Asian geography. Yeah, so it's quite interesting in terms of how you can see the nude itself or the Balinese nude can be used as a form of so-called artistic instrument to give the artist a certain Southeast Asian identity. Yeah, and I also like to kind of focus on this artwork by Liu Kang. And it is very interesting to me how Liu Kang titled this artwork by calling it artist and model because it is a most uh, alluding to the archetype of artist and model um, that the artist and model trope that we we'll always see in Western art history. And also at the same time, the artist also cause, um, also brings up to us this process of artist artistic creation by highlighting the prominent role of the artist, which is Chen Wenxi here, uh, drawing the model, which is who is just a regular, ordinary Balinese woman who is just going about doing her daily chores, but yet here she's posing as a model for the artist. Yeah, and so in a way, because it, could we also then perhaps see the artist's trip to Bali as an opportunistic one for them to um, actually look for models to draw and to practice this idea of life drawing when um, in our local landscape, there wasn't, there wasn't this kind of offering to them and they were actually deprived of this life drawing training within their art education. So this is, yeah, so we can perhaps look at this balance trick with a whole new intention and um, so-called perspectives in mind. Yeah, and so with all these contexts in mind, I'll just talk more about um, Group 90 and how it fits in the larger picture. So in the 1980s, we have this flourishing of alternative arts practices. So we have performances and installations. And so La LaSalle College of the Arts was very much founded um, as a response to, accommodate, to, to accommodate all these artistic demands. And in 1987, um, Mr. Nama joined LaSalle under the request of Brother, um, Brother McNally. But it was still in 1980s whereby we still see uh, debates about nudity in art and the nude in the art form still continue to exist, even though it was in the 1980s. And so in the 1990s, uh, Nama actually made the first attempt to introduce um, live drawing into LaSalle's official art curriculum, but it was actually met with internal resistance. So in his oral history interview, he actually quoted uh, a fellow staff who just told him that, oh, live drawing wasn't necessary for art anymore. So as a result of this internal resistance, it didn't um, come to the fruition. Um, but however, in the same year, Group 90 was founded in LaSalle, but not open to students. It was only for LaSalle lecturers who were really passionate about drawing from life. And I also have to stress that they um, were informal group, meaning that they were never registered under LaSalle. Yeah. And so after two years, uh, 1992, live drawing was officially implemented, but not in the Department of Fine Arts. It was actually interestingly implemented under the Department of Design. So what exactly happened between 1990 and 1992? Uh, I'm not very sure, but if everyone, is, everyone knows anything, feel free to just like, let me know and we can just add more to this conversation and ongoing research. Uh, but you can see that this compromise has been made between artistic demands of both lecturers and students as well as the institutional compromise to accommodate to such demands. Yeah. And so this is the photo of Group 90 at their first exhibition, Figurama, in 1991. And so during their active years, Group 90 held a total of six public exhibitions and published four exhibition catalogues. And yeah, so they had their exhibitions in many different public venues. And throughout their active years, they've always held an informal position. And so in many ways, their informal status also subscribes to the peripheral role that life drawing has come to play in the local art pedagogy as well as the institutional developments. And so uh, Nama, who is standing to um, the, my most right, um, he had also been cited as one of the instrumental players behind Group 90, mainly because he was actually the main procurer of new models. So in his oral history um, interview, what he would do is that he would leave his name cards in backpacker hotels for backpackers, um, usually foreign travellers, to come and pick it up and who wish to earn a quick buck. They would just contact him and just come and model for a session. So that was actually one of the main ways how Group 90 uh, secured um, the new models. So in a way, you can still see that back in the 90s, there was still a, a lack of supply of local new models. And Nama has to find this innovative way to actually reach out um, to them and to kind of overcome this resource constraint. Yeah. 
And so just to uh, refer back to Mr. Chia's words again, uh, if you just look at it, right, it's very clear as to what the group 90s goals were. So first, um, their artistic practice was, no question, just solely devoted to drawing from the nude and the study of the figure. And second, they were actually very much aware of the contemporary arts landscape whereby um, they understand that the nude was not in trend anymore and people were always shifting to the new contemporary arts practices. And so, they were actually actively rejecting the contemporary arts landscape in their effort to pursue the studio new as what I quote here is motive par excellence. Yeah, and so with this in mind, their every exhibition and every catalogue published could be seen as an intentional act of image making as well as branding effort towards at reaching out the other uh, the wider public in terms of what they're doing. Yeah, and so I just bring out three examples of um, Group 90's works here. Yeah, so it's actually very obvious how their works actually come in all shapes, medias and styles. You have Kenneth Miller, whose work is actually not a nude, but actually a self-portrait. So it's kind of like two, two dimensional conceptual piece at uh, challenging the limits of life drawing. You also have Mr. Lowe, uh, who draws with lines. And it's quite interesting because he also said that by drawing with lines, he is able to abstract the figure and create something that is more suitable to the public taste. It's also kind of like self-censorship in a way. And then lastly, you also have Nama, with, who deals a lot with like um, very bold brush strokes and colours, but you still have this very strong figure that manifests from the background. Yeah, I also included a slide about Nama's sketches, but I realised that you guys can see everything here. So from his sketches, you can really see, like as what Julian said, his devotion to the study of life drawing and how much he sees this as a very valuable training to have in an artist, in artist's um, entire development. And so, yeah, so in very much Nama was able to see the value of life drawing and that's why he was able to devote so much of his time and, um, and his artistic journey to perfecting and practicing this, this form of, um, to master the figure, like, so to say. Yeah. And so I'll just end off by drawing upon these two photos which I find pretty amusing about how Group 90s group photo in 1998 and the new model incident group photo that I showed earlier, about how similar um, these two groups, uh, because of their focus in life drawing, they actually represented themselves in a very similar format, both with the new model present and both like looking at the camera in the same way. And you can also see uh, Liu Kang here, and he was also in the original photo from Shanghai Art College. Yeah, so in a way, this is continuation of historical narrative when it comes to studying from the new and also how important our regional art history is very important, it's very valuable to us to make sense of uh, what exactly is happening, happening in our local and regional developments. Yeah, and so I'll just end off my presentation here. Feel free to just enjoy the exhibition and just um, also <coughs> hope, you, hope you guys can like uh, go home with a new perspective about the new and also the training of life drawing in general. Yeah, so um, most of my resource, uh, because, okay, so I in, managed to interview Mr. Loki Yu, so uh, to understand more of the group 90, because honestly, nothing much has been written about them. And so another form of information was also um, Mr. Nama's oral history interview. So, yeah, there was nothing I could find that talked about what happened between these two years. So maybe I should reach out to Beyond Group 90 to understand maybe um, the sales institutional records to see what exactly happened. Yeah, but at least live drawing was introduced, but who knows what happened in the middle, yeah. Thank you very much.